Good luck time, everyone. I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. In many parts of the world, technology and democracy are locked in a battle of wills. Technology can bolster authoritarian surveillance and corrode free and open societal institutions, while democracies tend to respond with Byzantine layers of regulation. But this conflict is avoidable. We can invest in technology that align with democratic values. At the moment, there is this epic struggle in the world between digital totalitarianism and digital democracy. And as the global democratic camp strives to turn back the tide of centralization and polarization, passive is turned into active and a new model of governance is being co-created. A bright and shiny example involves pandemic management over the past two and a half years. While many countries commenced combating coronavirus in 2020, we in Taiwan started in 2019, December, when the PRC whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliao disclosed the occurrence of so-called new SARS cases. Well, Dr. Li's whistleblowing quickly became harmonized by PRC authorities, but at the same time, Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit, the PTT, had a member by the name of No More Pipe sharing Dr. Li's posts. Clearly recognizing the importance of Dr. Li Wenliao's disclosure, the head of CDC immediately issued a directive requiring all passengers arriving in Taiwan from Wuhan to undergo health inspections the very next day, the New Year's Day of 2020. And this says two things to me. First, the civil society trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in a public forum. And the government trusts citizens enough to take such posts seriously and reactivate the tried and tested health management protocols since the SARS days since 2003. This is a textbook example of an open civil society in action. According to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the most open society in all of Asia. We enjoy the same freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of expression as other liberal democracies, but with the emphasis on keeping an open mind to new ideas, to innovations from all segments of society. So these are the cornerstones of Taiwan's collective intelligence response system. Take the mask map, for instance. When we ramped up facial mask production in early 2020, ensuring everyone can use National Health Insurance System cards to collect masks from nearby pharmacies, fairness was our guiding principle. Not only did we publish stock levels in all pharmacies, we also published every 30 seconds. And this real-time open API application programming interface enabled the mask maps at the onset of COVID-19. The government released information soon distributed to more than 100 different maps, chatbots, and voice assistants. G0V or Gov0 and many community contributors built those tools catering to the people who prefer different modalities of understanding where are the nearby pharmacies with some mask available. Now, this approach guaranteed everyone enjoyed the same inclusive access to information and also reduced fear, anxiety, and doubt. Now, Taiwan's national health insurance boasts more than 99.9% .9 of health coverage. So the access to masks was as easy as one, two, three to those exhibiting COVID-19-like symptoms. It was a given that a visit to a local clinic would be a painless and cost-free experience. And it also dovetailed with people's creation of dashboards, enabling closer and more transparent monitoring of supply by the whole of society. Now, we also took this as a step further. In the ease of use stakes, by working with convenience stores at a time, so that the same NHI card could be used to collect masks 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was a boon for those working longer hours than pharmacists who could miss the opportunity to collect the mask so such a progressive, people-centric approach relieved anxiety and facilitated a virtuous cycle of protecting Taiwan and helping the world. 
Similarly, the need to record contact information when entering and leaving public places in 2021, when we suffered our first real wave, enabled the 1922 SMS contact tracing system. Again, it's developed and deployed with the G0 VGov0 community in the shortest time possible, just three days. It doesn't require any installation of any apps, just a building camera can scan the QR code provided by the venues. And the civic tech community proposed this idea to enhance the effectiveness of the contact tracing system. The optimization means that in addition, not replacing the paper-based systems, people can use their phone to send the 15-digit random number to their local telecom who already knows about their phone number anyway, without revealing any information to the venue owner. And after four weeks of no local outbreak, the telecom will simply delete the message and throughout, the telecom knows nothing about what those 15 random digits correspond to which venue. We further collaborated with the five major telecoms. So when those carriers receive the um, search requests from the contact tracers, any person can look up which contact tracer from which municipality has looked at records uh, of their phone in the past four weeks. Again, this reciprocal transparency enabled a trust that this information is being used properly without diverting from its original use. Now, there was a judge who also posted a whistleblowing saying that there was a police filing a search warrant trying to re-identify the 15 digits of random code to, for a criminal case investigation. But because this was designed by people with privacy-enhancing technology capabilities, not only did the search warrant not go through because the judge said no to it, but also we very clearly said that this data collection must be deleted after four weeks, unlike traditional SMS, which was kept for six months. So the law enforcement must not have access to these 1922 SMS messages. So we ensure that the data is used appropriately just for the purpose of contact tracing while also guaranteeing information security. When the frontline contact tracing staff can rapidly grasp the projected scope of impact for any outbreaks, it reduces the contact tracing, which used to take more than 24 hours for the exposure notification to be sent to be less than 24 minutes. Now, contact tracing staff routinely need to conduct inquiries related to the digital footprint of specific cell phone numbers in order to assess the projected scope. So the public, as I mentioned, can check whether their data is being used appropriately. By visiting the sms.1922.gov.tw website and authenticating with the smartphone number, everyone can see that the data has been accessed by contact tracing staff within the previous 28 days. Now, the important point to note is that when contact tracing staff submit an application to inquire about a specific number, the application for data records is submitted to the associated telecommunications service provider via the contact tracing assistance platform. Once the checking records are obtained, they can only be accessed online and never saved. The platform's database is able only to make a record of which contact tracing unit at what time checked the cell phone number. And of course, after 28 days, the entire record are deleted in the system. When developing digital policies, cybersecurity and personal data protection consistently receive a great deal of attention. In Taiwan, aside from maintaining the strict control over the scope of data reuse, we also open the channel for the public to make inquiries concerning their own data. In this way, data is collected with citizens in mind and citizen empowerment at heart. And this is the core philosophy of our digital transformation. Data can only be appropriately used if it is appropriately sourced. Another key focus is investment in the technologies empowering diverse collaboration. As we have seen, those technologies have flourished together in our democracy. 
And these changes are ushered in with a decisive start via the sunflower movement in 2014. The world saw firsthand a prototype of digital democracy, effective direct actions made under the auspices of professional guidance, of facilitators and civic technologists. After the movement achieved its initial aims, the administration invited the civic tech community to set up various platforms allowing the public to participate directly and assume the role of a force for innovation in policy making. Since 2016, each ministry has established an open government participation officer team as a window for interministerial cooperation as well as communication bridges between the public sector and the people. And on join.gov.tw, our online participation platform, anyone can initiate a proposal, collect more than 5,000 signatures online, and the Open Government Participation Officer will invite stakeholders to hold cross-sectoral collaborative meetings to discuss options for incorporating ideas into governmental decision-making. In this way, all members of society, even those too young to vote, have the opportunity to develop entirely new policies. In addition to making policy suggestions, the private sector directly participates in this co-creation as well. The presidential hackathon, an important vehicle for advancing digital public infrastructure, has been held for five consecutive years. We have welcomed thousands of social entrepreneurs, civil servants, and teams from dozens of countries each year, we see five outstanding teams selected, awarded by the president upon conclusion of the event, promising the personnel, budget, and regulatory support to scale their local innovation into a nationwide one. Taiwan's experience has shown that digital democracy is not a castle in the sky, but rather a kingdom of heaven. The crucial point is governments must trust the citizens, to present ideas, to express opinions on policy reform as part and parcel of daily life. And the beauty is that any country can adopt the same approach, making the government decision-making process transparent and use collaborative tools to assist. So scattered public opinion can be transformed into an ongoing cycle of people-public-private partnerships. What's been tried and true over the years in Taiwan it's more than just our country's democratic experiment, but rather a common goal now of global partners. In 2022, I've signed a Declaration for the Future of Internet, alongside representatives of 60 other democratic partners, formally expanding the people-public-private partnership as a shared value for democratic allies. Now, in the declaration, countries with similar ideas jointly pledge to promote the openness and the interoperability of the digital economy in a plural, inclusive way. We have vowed to use the multi-stakeholder governance approach to build the internet into a resilient structure, strengthening mutual trust and protection of freedom and human rights. So simply put, the declaration emphasizes the multi-stakeholder connections, a network of networks decentralized, polycentered, and interdependent within the structure of the internet itself. It can be seen that the strategy for digital transformation is not to do top-down, lockdowns, shutdowns, but rather to construct a democratic network via the internet to promote innovation based on those shared interests and values. In our administration over the past six years, we have proposed the DG plus DIGI for digitization, innovation, governance, and inclusion. Throughout the past six years, it laid the foundation for digital transformation, integrating the spirit of diversity and integration, improves the quality of digital services, promotes cybersecurity, resilience, and industrial transformation. We have also met the challenges of cross-border data governance and includes our 20 national languages with full respect of the goal of fostering digital inclusion. In this August, the Ministry of Digital Affairs, or MODA, was launched with plurality as our overarching vision. 
The MODA concentrates on the core value of digital resilience for all, and it was found that this plural heterogeneity and societal resilience, they are indispensable. Maintaining diversity in data and systems is the most comprehensive preparation and mutual trust and assistance and protection between the government and our people offers the most meticulous security. And in order to improve the digital resilience of our official systems, including websites, good use was made of public code by deploying on existing Web2 and Web3 backbones. We utilized the polycenter structure and created heterogeneous services. Even if a certain part is under attack, like the HTTPS, the availability in this system can be maintained through a joint defense with the interplanetary file system. Now, the most important transnational case for public code in recent years is the X-Road system maintained by the governments of Estonia, Finland, and Iceland. All parties in the X-Road system are free to use for domestic services, such as applying for subsidies, renewing licenses, but when any of the participants find problems, they can immediately propose corrections and feed them back into the shared system. And this enabled all other agencies to update synchronously. So X-Road and other public code systems are like international railways. The participating countries share the same tracks, schedule, and even rolling stock specifications. And while tracks and related facility like the station are maintained on a jurisdictional basis, if one of the party repairs problems or develop new parts, it can advise others so as to share experience and improve service quality. In addition to public code, I also want to talk about data. Our successful experience of the Taiwan Can Help Health for All program launched by our government during the pandemic, enable anyone to turn the uncollected mass quota in 2020 into humanitarian aid. Throughout the course of 2020, more than 7 million medical grade masks were dedicated to international humanitarian aid this way. Through this model, the data of an individual donor can be processed in a non-personal way. With their consent, they can be reused for public good purposes and will not endanger the privacy or trade secret of individuals or organizations. And we are very glad to see the EU affirming this idea with Data Governance Act, officially adopted this June. Data altruism emphasizes the beneficial purpose of data for scientific research and improving public service. Individual and non-personal data holders provide voluntarily, free of charge, for a non-profit social development. So the facilitation of data altruism coupled with public code can make improvements co-creative. The common characteristics of public code and data altruism are initiative from each and every participant and partner, giving a sense of purpose to the shared data and code landscapes. So today, we have the chance to together build better tomorrows, where our technologies express and empower our highest ideals, rather than degrading those ideals. Realizing digital resilience for all necessitates our ministry, the MODA, expanding our scope by co-creating a common vision and integrating the resonant feelings of all related stakeholders through resilience building and open thinking. There's no question that every citizen, whether they be an activist, artist, technologist, or policymaker, has a key role to play. The best of times can be experienced through our model of inclusive co-creation while bolstering the global impetus to free the future. Thank you very much for listening, and I wish to conclude with my job description in the form of a prayer that I wrote in 2016. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it the Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And 
Whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you again for listening. Live long and prosper.